Chaz Lanier is a Tennessee prospect that appears to be opening up his recruitment a little bit as BYU has stepped into the chase for him. What can you tell us about Chaz Lanier? So Chaz Lanier, it sounded like Tennessee was in the lead for a while. He was testing his NBA draft waters. He's a transfer from North Florida. And it seemed like if he wasn't going to the NBA, Tennessee was the easy favorite to land him. And then Kentucky got into play with Mark Pope. And now BYU, Mark Pope's former school, has gotten into play. Kentucky, Chaz Lanier is visiting Kentucky today. So it sounds like a lot of people think that he's leaning towards Kentucky. But he is also going to be visiting BYU, I believe, later this week. So Chaz Lanier is really looking at different things. Oh, and his Instagram story yesterday had him in Provo, which is in Utah. So he's actually, I take that back, already visited BYU. So he's visited BYU and he's visited Kentucky. I think he's going to make a decision very soon. I can't imagine it not being down to Tennessee and Kentucky, quite honestly, if he's trying to do what he wants to do. Well, and here's the scary part, though. And this used to happen in recruiting. When you say a guy suddenly opened up his recruitment or changed his mind, you always thought that he got an under-the-table offer. Now, they're not under the table anymore. But if BYU wants to make itself look good – after losing their coach and they've got a pile of cash sitting around dropping it on Lanier would, would be significant. And so that to me, to me, I take all my allegiances to either Tennessee or Kentucky and throw them out the door. I think he's a guy that's looking for the best deal. And if BYU says a million dollars and Tennessee says 500,000, I think he's going to BYU. You think if Tennessee says a million and BYU says 500,000 backwards, I said that. Before. Oh, okay. If BYU says a million and Tennessee says five hundred thousand, I think I think he's shopping himself right now. And I'm not, that's not a knock. Okay, shop yourself. Get you may have Tennessee may have slipped in there and got you before you realized how much you were worth. Well, now you know how much you're worth. So go get what you're worth. Well, here's the thing: he's doing two things. He's shopping himself, yes, but I still think he's making he's going to make the decision of what he thinks is best for his future. But why not in the process of doing that? opening up your recruitment so you force schools to you can leverage yourself to get more nil money there's no harm in that whatsoever and for, for the play from your perspective really so, so he comes back to tennessee mean, and says byu offered me x can you offer me x and i'm in yeah exactly and maybe even tennessee offers less but he says okay but tennessee okay now i, I they offer me less than byu but they offer me more than they initially did and it's enough for me to come here for my and it's best for my future so there's a lot in play here now kentucky now has 11 scholarships filled. They just filled their 11th scholarship over the weekend with another transfer. So it's 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 hard for me to believe that he would pick Kentucky out of outside of anything but the lore of prestige. I don't know if Kentucky has the NIL money to open to offer to him right now the way that he expects. BYU may because BYU maybe open up the checkbook just for him. But I can't imagine those two schools being able to offer that much more than Tennessee has on the NIL front. And so I think that's that's where this is a bit tricky. Look, I'm still I, I know people are excited. This is not my boo Carter prediction from last November, but I still think he ends up in Tennessee. I'm going to tell you guys, I think he ends up at Tennessee. I think he sees Tennessee and he sees what Barnes did with Dalton Connect last year. And he says, man, I could be a starter right now in this system and become a star. And so I think he's leaning Tennessee because of that. Well, as far as big pickups, where would you rate this from a scale of 1 to 10? A 10 in retrospect was Dalton Connect. So I think this guy is supposed to be of that similar ilk, but I'm not willing to go there. So I'll say seven and a half, eight. I'll, I'm going to lean seven. And the only reason is there's something that stands out if you only like break out like your last year. You know, he wasn't a double figure scorer until this past year. However, Dalton Connect was a late bloomer. So sometimes he would just emerge late. I mean, for those who don't know, Scotty Pippen was I think the water guy for Arkansas uh, State, wasn't he? Or Central Arkansas, wherever he was at. He was like the water boy and like grew like six inches, um, which is what helped him emerge to become a superstar, grew like in one all season. And that's when he became the big star. So, I mean, sometimes players, and this really shows in basketball, they have a growth spurt late. They develop, they refine their skills late. That happens sometimes. It looks like it may have happened with Chaz Lanier. So I think that, but I am still leaning seven because of how late he bloomed. Now, also, the other part of this is if Chaz Lanier commits, I don't think he's guaranteed a starting spot. 
let's break down Tennessee's roster real quick. Felix Opara and Igor Milicic are their inside players. You have Darlington Dubar, who is their next Dalton Connect, is on the wing. You have Zakai Ziegler as the point guard. Chaz has got to beat out Jemai Meshack to be a starter. And we don't know if he's going to do that. Particularly when, as you can tell, Jemai Meshack has... Has anybody more embraced developing under Rick Barnes than Meshack? Man, I'm I'm just I'm, I'm telling you, I wish if if I ever start another career, Caleb, it's going to be as a prospect advisor. And I know there's not a lot of money because we're talking about some rural kids, some inner city kids who don't have a lot of money. But wouldn't you love to sit down with Chaz Lanier and say, "I'm I'm being objective here with you, buddy." If BYU offers you $5,000 more, you should still go to Tennessee based off Rick Barnes and the character that he will develop with you and the fact that he's proven he can turn out a fantastic wing scorer in Dalton Connect. <clears throat> Not to mention he did so with a guy named Kevin Durant, I think was his name. So <clears throat> it just, to me, 5000 or even 50000 or even 100000 I don't think would necessarily change my mind from making the better business decision. I know business is part money, but not the better NIL decision. The better future decision maybe is a better way to put it. I just don't even think it's close. I, I, off the top of my head, I don't know who BYU's head coach is. Head I actually don't either. But the, yeah. the So he's not as storied as Rick Barnes. We know that. He doesn't have a 30-year career. But the selling point, Dave, on this is playing time. If he's looking to... If he's, if he's looking to build up his NBA profile, he's got to play a lot. And there's a lot of competition for Tennessee for playing time right now. I mean, he'll he'll play, but do you, would you rather would you rather be a rotational player in Rick Barnes' backcourt for your only year of eligibility, or would you rather be averaging 30 to 35 minutes a game for another team? I'd rather have the ball in my hand and score a lot. Which is so, the 30, 35 minutes a game. Yeah. That's where the BYU factor probably comes into play. But and, I think aren't all schools promising him that, maybe with the exception of Kentucky because they have such a big class? I don't think Tennessee can promise him a lot of playing time. They can't. Not with Darlene Stone Dubar and Jemai Meshack. They can promise him to be in the rotation. They can't promise him 25 to 30 minutes a game. There's no way they can promise him that with their backcourt the way it is. Hmm. Well, if they lose him based off playing Tom, do they really need him that much anyway? Well, I think that, well, yes, because they need a player like him in that rotation. They don't have that right now, particularly with Freddie DeLeon and um, Freddie DeLeon hitting, hitting the portal. But, you know, I the other part of this is we have to remember, I don't think Tennessee's as desperate for him because they are so high on Cameron Carr taking the next step. So we're talking the backcourt right now with Ziegler, Meshack, Dubar and then Cameron Carr off the bench, but they would love a second guard that could really make a, a second backcourt scorer that could really make an impact. So, I mean, I think that, I think that's where, I think that's the big thing with Chaz Lanier. Now I'm trying to remember exactly, cause you're right. This is a guy looking for like that next splash, his final year of eligibility, the way Darling Stone Dubar, I mean, the way Dalton connected. And I think Darling Stone Dubar is doing. However, at the same time, we could also bring up the fact that I, I believe he may actually have two years of eligibility left. No, he only has one. He only has one because the the COVID season doesn't count against somebody also took a red shirt that year. So he only has one year of eligibility left. And so he's looking for maximized maximum playing time his last year of eligibility. In two words, I will give you the reason that uh BYU would, would scare me a little bit. Brought to you by Boundless Moving from their two-hour minimum to the turnkey operations. They've got you covered. Boundless Moving. Just Google them at Boundless Moving or go to BoundlessMoving.com in East Tennessee or in Charlotte. Two words why you shouldn't go to BYU. Multiple wives. <laughs> the potential. I don't want to get caught up in that because you, you, you think about, you know, you'd like two women interested in you, but – Really, when you get to our age, Caleb, you don't. One wife is enough. Is that not correct? Oh, yeah. Be having multiple girls when you're in college especially, is one thing. Having multiple wives is uh especially well. when you've got one that's like eight months pregnant. You practically got multiple wives now because she should be so miserable, especially in the summer, that she should be a little gripey. And I'm gonna go ahead and say that 
Jordan, you, you have permission to be gripey to Caleb. How fitting is it that uh, Utah was the one place Carl Malone could play at over 20 years, given what he did? Let's move along. This day <laughs> in Tennessee sports history is coming up. By the way, I, you know, with the internet, there's probably things about, I didn't know Larry Bird had an illegitimate child until like I was 40. And it kind of, you know, he wouldn't talk to her and it kind of turned me off on him a little bit. But, but nowadays, at least it wasn't like oh, I know, statutory but, rape. I know, but I didn't, the point is I didn't know that. My son, he can Google all these guys. So we're playing NBA Live and he goes up and he's like, this Carl Malone guy's pretty cool. And then he looks him up and he's like, he comes downstairs and he's like, hey, dad, did you know? And I'm like, eh, I was hoping you wouldn't look that up. 